We're here today to talk about blockchain. What is it and why should you care about it? We're here with Natalie Smolinski, the chairman of the board for the Texas Blockchain Council. So Natalie, the audience has probably seen some videos or, or read some articles. They may still be confused about the basic fundamentals of what blockchain is. Why don't you describe it for them? Sure, no, uh, a blockchain is, we often call it a distributed ledger, but all that means is it's a way of tracking ownership of assets digitally in a way that no one can alter. And the reason that's important is because if you have, um, let's say, uh, a government or a company or an individual who controls a ledger that says who owns what, they can then edit that ledger, alter, alter the ledger, change the terms of the ledger. Blockchain technology prevents that. Um, and so in some ways, it's kind of super boring. It's like uh, an advanced accounting technology, but it creates the infrastructure for a global network of value that acts as a new layer for the whole internet. So the applications of this are literally infinite. So there's this phrase that I'm sure you and I, have, we've probably heard a million times and we talk about it, but the blockchain will do for the transfer of value what the internet did for the dissemination of information. Correct. Expound upon that a bit. Right, so the inter internet is great at moving information from point A to point B. What it's not good at is telling you whether that information is true. The blockchain kind of arose to solve that problem, specifically in the realm of money. So before blockchain technology, you could create a digital dollar, no problem, but you could also create a million digital dollars or three million digital dollars and easily say that you owned it, which in effect makes that digital dollar worthless. So what blockchain technology did, um, specifically Bitcoin, um, which originally was actually called a time chain, not a blockchain, um, is it created a set monetary policy, so a limited number of Bitcoin, um, and then it created this ledger that nobody could hack or tamper with so that you knew exactly who owned how many Bitcoin um, at any point in time. And that's what created the digital scarcity that made digital money possible in the first place. So talk about the, the white paper, Satoshi Nakamoto, the pseudonymous nature of all that. A lot of yeah. people get hung up on where did this come from? Who, right. Who's behind it all? And I think there's sort of this uh, narrative that those of us in the Bitcoin community and, uh, and the blockchain in general all know and we've known for a long time, but it takes some time to explain and it, it gives uh, really this, uh, this story almost creates more trust yeah. in, the, in that we don't, there's no like centralized, you know, group that's behind it. It's, it's it, from the very beginning, it was distributed. That's right. No, it's an extraordinary origin story. Um, you know, Satoshi Nakamoto, who you know could be one person, could be many people, um, was the pseudonym of um, the inventor of Bitcoin, um, and they never revealed their true identity and disappeared uh, after only a few years. So um, we aren't sure if they're they're still alive or where they could possibly be. And I like to. Um, likened this to the foundation of the American Republic, where, you know, uh, after the Revolutionary War, there was this huge push to make George Washington king of America. And he was the general who refused to be king. In the same way, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto was the coder who refused to be king of this domain of Bitcoin. Um, and so that, you know, if you think of the Enlightenment era political revolutions as some of the first steps humanity made towards decentralization by separating powers um, through branches of government. This is a whole new stage of separation of powers, creating a decentralized digital network with no king, with no owner, um, that self-sustains itself through the incentive structures that are based into the network itself. And it's fascinating to look at the, the wallet that Satoshi controls and how much Bitcoin is in there. The, the dollar value of it is, yeah. um, it blows your mind. Right. And I think what the audience may not know is that that money's never moved. Right, it's never been spent. Uh, so personally, I feel like perhaps Satoshi has passed away. Mm. Uh, yeah. But uh, no one no one really knows, right? right. Maybe, maybe one or two people in the world know. Right. Um, 
but talk a little bit more about the the self control. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. Do you do you have an idea of the, the dollar amount? I know it changes, it fluctuates with the price of Bitcoin, but it's. It's in the billions. I can't remember exactly what it was. Right. Well, you have to remember, you know, people are motivated in very different ways. Yeah. Um, the Bitcoin network arose as a culmination of decades of research and experiments in computer science by the cypherpunks, um, who are a group of, of coders who literally took it upon themselves to create a digital infrastructure to preserve individual privacy and autonomy in the face of increasing encroachment from um, both the private and public sector. Um, so the, the cypherpunks you know, were sometimes branded enemies of the state, they were sometimes derided or laughed at, but they were um, computer scientists and cryptographers who slowly and diligently created the conditions for, uh, for freedom. Um, and so, you know, most of these people are not actually motivated by money. Mm -hmm. They're motivated by um, liberty, by justice, um, by a sense of personal autonomy and the ability to realize your purpose, um, unconstrained by uh, the surveillance of either the state or corporations. And so these people, you know, many of them, um, may be extraordinarily wealthy today, but um, that, that never really is what motivated them in the first place. That's a good point. Yeah. Let's bring it uh, back to what everybody needs to know about blockchain. You know, there's things that um, none of us know about the internet, but we know we use applications that use the internet. But there are a few fundamental pieces that perhaps in the next 10 years, everyone that interacts on the internet will know about blockchain, will sort of have this in the back yeah. of their mind. What are those key tenets? Not, not really the technical pieces, but sort of the overarching pieces. Yeah, you know, I, I think people are going to get used to the fact that the blockchain is the single source of truth, the record of truth for transacting on that network. Um, and so, you know, people will understand if something's on the blockchain, that means it's part of a shared permanent record that cannot be edited. Um, now, what that also means in practice is that very little information actually does get encoded on chain. Um, so like the public blockchains like Bitcoin and Ethereum, um, you know, you don't, you're not actually putting like plain text data or human readable data on chain. What you're doing is um, abstracting away from that data either through technical standards like you know, uh, uh, verifiable credentials, block certs, um, decentralized identifiers, um, or uh, layer two applications like the Lightning Network um, that allow you to scale the transactions on chain by like an order of millions uh, in the case of Lightning Network um, without actually having to put all of that um, human data or human identifiable data directly on the blockchain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when we use, you know, when, when, when an everyday person uses email, they don't know that they're necessarily using TCP IP or, right. or any of these other protocols. Exactly. When do you think, how, how many years or months do you think it will take for the average person to use blockchain on a daily basis? I think it's all going to come down to consumer friendly applications like with anything else. Um, and we're already seeing those arise. Um, there are you know, multiple companies, for example, that have produced lightning wallets where you can now uh, send or receive Bitcoin um, at extraordinarily low fees or free, even in many cases. Um, and that is only possible because of the layer two protocols um, that have been developed on that network. Um, so as we see a startup ecosystem build around it, it's just like the World Wide Web. Mm -hmm. You know, TCP IP is the protocol layer. Um, the World Wide Web is the application layer that allowed companies like, you know, Amazon and Google and Facebook to create these user-friendly applications, which is what we use day to day. So the same thing's gonna happen with blockchain. Mm -hmm. so, so you answered it very eloquently, but you didn't give the viewers an, uh, a <laughs> date or a number that, when, when was somebody, like when will my parents use blockchain every day? Well, just, just throw out a number. You know, um, that's, I don't think we can say that now, or I don't think we can answer that question now because adoption is so uneven. Like some countries 
are already using blockchain technology yeah. for um, confirmation of digital identity of, let's say, organizations or citizens. Um, other countries are, you know, way behind. They're still fighting it. Um, so in America, what's interesting is I think that the answer to that question might be different on a state to state basis. Mm. And this is why the work that the Texas Blockchain Council is doing is so important because you know we want to see Texas really take the lead on this um, and have the most technologically advanced infrastructure uh, that our citizens and residents can use without a second thought. That's a great point. Yeah, yeah. when you look at the global adoption, Vietnam leads the way. <laughs> uh, and that's probably because yeah. it, it's a, more of a statement of their financial services infrastructure right. and the fact that their citizenry are realizing right. we need to right. do something different. Right. Uh, and, and we're sort of in this environment in the United States that's very comfortable. We, we have mm -hmm. things that work, mm -hmm. but they work like the fax machine used to work, yeah. right? I, I had someone tell me one time that they literally remember telling somebody years ago, well, why do we need email? We have the facts. It works right. perfectly well. Exactly. And now it's kind of a ludicrous statement to, right. to make, but back at the time it was made by, I'm sure, many executives. Right. Uh, and so we're at this point now where we could say, well, why do we need blockchain? We have double entry accounting mm -hmm. or we have banks that um, yep. basically keep all the ledgers for us. We have trusted third party um, middlemen mm -hmm. that for a small fee yeah. will you know create these trust layers mm -hmm. between business transactions um, and when I say small I should put that in quotes <laughs> sometimes it's yeah. very significant in a dollar right. amount um, so yeah, I do think it's important for people to be educated on this I know you think that as well yeah. where, where would you send somebody to especially somebody who's watching this who may live in in you know Texas or the United States as a whole, how can um, they resource themselves and equip themselves to be ready for these kinds of conversations? Yeah, you know, I think uh, the first, the easiest and most accessible way to um, begin learning about blockchain technology is to make some initial small investments. You know, nothing you that you can't afford to lose, but um, try it. There are many companies. Um, that are you know well regarded and well established at this point, um, where you can set up a, a wallet um, and buy and hold uh, cryptocurrencies. So that's that's kind of the the low hanging fruit, so to speak. Um, on the digital identity side, um, this is really where I think individuals can use their voices and contact their representatives, their senators, um, to let them know that you know. This is something that's really important to them. Um, I, I want to be able to transact on the internet without my personal data being just like harvested immediately by dozens of companies who then sell it and resell it. Um, and now I'm getting you know, 15 robocalls a day um, that, that I can't turn off. Like th this is a major problem. And, and blockchain technology actually is a major part of the solution but our um, political leaders need to hear from us that this is something important. Yeah, yeah. the uh, micropayments piece could actually prevent some spam emails right. and spam calls because the current financial infrastructure with Visa doesn't allow for that kind of, mm -hmm. uh, those, those payment rails are so expensive that those micropayments can't, right. uh, are not economically feasible. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, a lot of um, the underpinnings of blockchain technology is actually anti-spam technology. It's preventing DDoS attacks. Um, that's part of the animating principle behind Byzantine fault tolerance um, in general. So that same technology is now creating the ability to carve out a space of what um, I like to call self-sovereignty on the internet, meaning you, know, you own and are the uh, custodian of your own data. You decide who gets access to it, under what conditions. Um, you can revoke that access. You can um, transfer your data to trusted third parties. Um, all of that is enabled by the, the time chain layer, the in immutable ledger that we call blockchain. So where can we send people to learn more about um, the Texas Blockchain Council, learn about, more about you? I know you publish quite a, quite a lot. Mm -hmm. um, 
wh where would they go to find that? Uh, I think a great place to start is um, TexasBlockchainCouncil.org. Um, we have policy papers there. We have blog posts um, that people can learn about. Um, and we also have a legislative toolkit um, that you know, can help anybody understand what we need to achieve from a policy standpoint to ensure blockchain technology is widely accepted. Love it. So we'd love to, uh, you guys to subscribe to the YouTube channel, TexasBlockchainCouncil.org is where you can find a lot of stuff. Follow Natalie on, on Twitter. Uh, she's always tweeting about things that are far more intellectual than, than I could ever uh, imagine to tweet about. So thanks for joining us today. We'll see you next time. Thank you.